Today is going to be um, a slightly different day. I was late in getting out the announcement this week. Um, had a lot of things uh, occurring that were really taking up time and energy. So what we're going to do is do a review and to have a presentation on the sanctuary. So let me start with our review. And this is simply going to be things that we should be able to answer as we go on this journey of medical missionary work. Um, I don't see the capacity to full size it. Oh, I'm in slides. Mm. I stopped sharing my screen. Sorry about that. One moment. Okay, thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to ask, begin with a review of, do you have the answers to these questions memorized? So my first question to you is, what is disease? <laughs> Anyone can unmute and go ahead and respond. Was that the right one? Oh, diseases. Yes, please go ahead and answer. I'm sorry, I didn't know that I was unmuted. I don't know okay. the complete thing, but disease is an effort of nature to free the to free the body of system. Uh, <laughs> To free the body of conditions brought on by, I don't remember the rest, sorry. Excellent, excellent. I thought I heard a little one answering, so I was like, ah! <laughs> yes, yes, she was answering too. So, thank you. Uh, I, the one I have this up, I can't see who's talking. So who was speaking? Yeah, it's Diane. Paul. Oh, Paul. Diane. Good. And Good morning. So, and who is the third person? I was Sorry. trying to help her finish it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so disease is an effort of nature to free the bot, free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. Excellent. And so that's from Councils on Health, page ninety. So. We want to have that um, just repeat until we can get that memorized, because in knowing this definition, it informs our steps as medical missionaries. And what is the first step? Tell you how many days to stay out of work until mm. you come back. Ascertain the cause. Because it's a hospital. Can, someone, um, can you please mute? Yeah, 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 yeah. John W. It's unmuted. John W. Okay, I'm gonna have to close out. He doesn't even. He doesn't even matter anymore. Nobody. Okay. Thank you so much. So yes, ascertain the cause. That is the first step. What's the second step? Anyone, please go ahead and unmute yourselves.
So first we need to figure reason from cause to effect. Why is this occurring? And the second step, I'm just guessing. After you figure the cause, then the second step is to prepare to treat it. Very close. Unhealthful conditions should be changed and wrong habits corrected. Oh, I so see. Once we ascertain the cause, then we have to look at the laws. And so where we're violating the laws, we've got to get back into alignment. So that's basically step two. Sorry, Natasha, could you go back to the first slide? Let me just get a screenshot, please. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Super. You're welcome. So when we were eating French fries, we're eating whole foods, plant-based. When we were drinking soda, you know, that's dealing with nutrition. But when we're sitting down, we're getting movement, whether it be gardening, whether it be walking. So that's the second step. Can anyone tell me the third step? It's a three-step process. One, ascertain the cause. Two, unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected, and three. You pretty much use nature and all its healing products to help you to heal. Amen. Thank you. So step three is then, then after we've done those first two, nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So this is where we're using hydrotherapy. This is where we're using herbs. This is where those auxiliary techniques that um, sometimes our, our people like to run to first is where they are put into place and into practice. So this morning, I just want to start with a review of these simple questions that when we're dealing with people and when we are doing the work that we can have memorized to be able to say them to explain what we're doing and why we're doing and why we're doing it and also this is a reminder preparation that um, for next week our speaker will be brother don miller and he spoke with us um, at the beginning of this year on stewardship, which is expanding the eight laws to include all that was um, said about health and spirit of prophecy. And he uses this acronym, acronym of sunlight, trust, exercise, air. So there we're dealing with the new start or the God, God's plan, but also to have attitude. By attitude, we mean cheerfulness, dealing with the mental rest and regularity. So by regularity, that's keeping of your meals and your sleep and your worship time. We have diet, and then we also have dress, and we know the importance of dress reform and how that affects the physiology, but also how um, that can be used as a temptation to um, adorn oneself self-control, temperance. Then we have hygiene, which is spoken about um, throughout Spirit of Prophecy, but that dealing with cleanliness of our environment and orderliness. Herbs, of course, is part of that third step. Innocence or a clear conscience, this impacting the mental aspect. And we know that nine-tenths of diseases begin in the mind, but we know all healing starts in the mind. And finally, the P in stewardship is purity of life. So Brother Don will be speaking with us next week, presenting next week, 
and just wanted to recap um, his sharing of the eight laws plus eight laws plus <laughs> to encourage to encompass all that what we see in spirit of prophecy in the word of God. Any questions? All right. Well, um, today we're going to have a presentation on the sanctuary as that relates to health. And this will be um, the part where we're having some time to share on this topic and to grow in our knowledge of how this relates to our and to salvation. So one moment, please. All right. This is a recorded presentation by Brother Don McIntosh, who is um, teaches out at Weimer Institute, well, now Weimer College. So let us begin. And I, we might be a little short on time. That's OK. We're going to say, as I said earlier, be having the sanctuary as it relates to health more than once. So this is our introduction. Well, good morning. And we have an exciting subject to talk about today, the sanctuary and health. Uh, I've enjoyed the series, amazing sanctuary, all the different components I've been able to hear. Looking forward to looking over them and listening to them and studying more deeply. The sanctuary and health. Um, okay. The sanctuary actually was a review, as we recall, maybe from our previous lesson, and certainly my lesson, of the Exodus experience. The sanctuary was a review of the escaping the death and diseases of Egypt and going to God's holy mountain. And so as they left Egypt, um, they sprinkled blood on the doorpost, and that was memorialized by that Passover sacrifice in the sanctuary. As they went through the Red Sea, that was memorialized by the laver. As they went to the base of the mountain where Moses had been, they had the burning bush, and that was memorialized by the lampstands. And then the meal on the mountain where Moses and the 70 went up was memorialized with that table of showbread. And then Moses intercedes, and you have that intercession um, memorialized by the altar of incense. And then he receives the law of God from the presence of God, in the presence of God himself. And so the escape from Egypt was memorialized in the sanctuary. If you were going to get a pair of, or if you were going to get some cosmetic or, or, or Christian jewelry, I know that uh, Daniel would say that's probably not appropriate, but if you were going to, uh, if you were going to go and buy something, you wouldn't just buy a cross, you would buy a sanctuary set. And I can, I can guarantee you if you have a sanctuary set on and you're walking around, people are going to notice. So this escape, this escape from the mountains, the false mountains of Egypt to God's mountain is what's memorialized in the sanctuary. Now, as they escape from Egypt, they also escape from the diseases of Egypt. They've studied about 30 or 40,000 mummies and maybe a few daddies as well, and they looked over these mummies, <laughs> and they looked over these mummies, and they actually discovered that um, the Journal of the American Medical Association back, way back in 2009, they looked and they found that the mummies showed signs of heart disease and many other diseases. And I'm going to ask you to help me with diagnosis. Dia means through, gnosis means to know. A diagnosis so we can look at what the diseases of Egypt were because sanctuary health brought them out of those diseases. Help me out. What's this guy's problem? Someone told me he has a cardiac crease there in his ear. But, um, but yeah, I think this, he's, you can see that he, has, he struggles a bit. Uh, with obesity, right? So this was one of the problems in Egypt. What about this problem? Someone told me, well, he got, he got hit by three arrows. <laughs> that's what they tell me. And that's not the point. It's kind of pointing to a problem. What is the problem there? He's got gallbladder disease. Correct. I heard that. What's this problem? Don't tell me he has no skin. I've heard that before. Um, what's the problem here? He's got, he's got dental cavities, right? So in this particular book, and they said that it's because of the sugary drinks in in Egypt. Um, I was just impressed that he had teeth, but that's what that said in this book of diagnosis of diseases in Egypt. What about, what about this one here? 
again, you might see the arrows pointing here, 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 and here. I'm sure you saw that. Um, and these are the femurs, these big bones right here. And these are phalanges, his fingers are hanging down here. But it's really looking at the soft tissue. In that soft tissue, you can see a vessel. And what they said in the book is that's atherosclerosis, so hardening of the arteries. So it's interesting that all of the diseases, the major diseases that we struggle from in the um, American Western cultures, they struggled from in Egypt. And uh, this is, I should have put a better picture of this one, but because there are toilets over there in Egypt, but they actually, someone did for their PhD dissertation a study of the latrines in Egypt. Um, I don't know, if your kid decided that for their PhD, would you be happy? I don't know. Anyway, so, <laughs> but they studied the latrines and they found that they had um, the remnants of parasites and all kinds of things that happened from eating various uh, flesh meats as well. So we have a pretty good picture of what the diseases were in Egypt. And again, remember, the sanctuary is nothing more than a summary of the exodus from Egypt. Ex hodas. We see the exit signs here. And ex means out. Odas means the metered, measured way out. We get the word odometer. So he was leading them out of those diseases. So any presentation of the sanctuary without presenting health would be <laughs> missing uh, a big thing. And of course, um, in Psalm 77, it says he led them out with his right hand. In Exodus 15, his right hand. That's why some call the health message the right hand of the gospel. Exodus chapter 15 makes a big point of that. And, you know, um, we've learned now, and as they were leaving Egypt, they said, you know, there's a lot of diseases. Maybe you should, when you go to the bathroom, go outside the camp and bury things. So we have our sanitation systems even today coming from the Exodus experience. So how did God really remove these diseases? This is the sanctuary health plan. First of all, he didn't send a helicopter or um, something to, to, to rapture them out of Egypt. They walked out of Egypt. And of course, walking and exercise is, is very positive, right? What did they eat? The Bible says that they ate manna, which literally means what is it? That means they were not used to seeing it. They didn't know that kind of food. Lots of times when people get healthy and they start eating uh, plant-based foods, they say that. What is that? <laughs> you know, they actually use manna. They're saying, what is that? I say, man, you're using a Bible word. <laughs> it's interesting that manna, when you look at manna in the Bible, it says that it, it was made out of coriander seed, or it looked like coriander seed. Um, so uh, coriander has been used as a folk medicine uh, for the reef of anxiety and insomnia. So even now, there is medicinal use for coriander seed that we find. They were coming out of a very anxious, anxiety-induced pharaoh experience, and so they needed to be calmed down, and that's a part of the manna, which is also a complex carbohydrate, which, you know, I'm not going to get too technical about this stuff. If you want to hear more about health, religion, and health, I teach a class like that at Weimark uh, in the health program, and I take four months. I, I don't have four months right now, so <laughs> just cover a few things with you today. What kind of drinks did God provide them? I just... I didn't get these from back in the, in, the, in the kitchen here. That's not from here, but which one of these? Uh, someone says Mountain Dew. Yeah, exactly. So he had, <laughs> yes, he had water that came from the rock. You see that again and again. And by the way, if you drink water, which I see some of you have bottles right now, but some of you look like you're a little tired, just take a drink because every bottle of water you drink will increase your reaction time, your ability of, uh, by a vast amount, about 15%. So if you drink a bottle of water when you're listening to me, that will help you actually pay attention. Now, when you look here at this, this is a summary of the Exodus, remember? Just like we went through. But now notice with me the nutrition of the sanctuary. Outside of the sanctuary were unclean animals. You could not bring, oh God, please bless my crocodile. This didn't happen. Please, as I bring to you my gerbils because I ran out of you know, turtle doves, you just couldn't do it. Uh, you did not bring unclean things into the sanctuary. And so they were walk God was teaching with his health plan, don't bring unclean things. And by the way, these unclean meats are the most unhealthy. And I could go through all of them and show you scientific studies, but just look it up. You've got Google. You look it up and you can see that. And there's numerous studies that show that. So then they moved in, into, the, into the courtyard area to clean animals. You know, find that list in, Le in Leviticus chapter 11. And those clean animals are those that are not scavengers, and they're much healthier for you. Now, does God love people who eat unclean animals? Sure. Does he love people that eat clean animals? 
How much longer can he love the people that eat clean animals versus unclean animals? Does God want to love you as long as possible? <laughs> so you got to help him out, right? Then they move next to the bread and grapes and olive oil, all plant-based sources. See that? Unclean meats, now animals, now plant-based things in the holy place. You have a table of showbread. You had a flagon of grape juice, which was, a, was the meal and drink offering. And then you had olive oil that was lighting these lamps that had almond blossoms that were used to decorate them, right? But then ultimately you move into um, the most holy place. You have manna in the ark, again a complex carbohydrate. Um, and then you had Aaron's rod that budded with almond blossoms, of fruitful almond blossoms. The high priest had pomegranates on the base. So you're back now to what? Fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. Can you see that God is moving his people with sanctuary health away from eating animals to going back to plant-based things, back to the Genesis 129 diet? And so people that adopt sanctuary health, they begin making that, that, that move back to fruits, nuts, grains, and, 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 and vegetables. Just like Daniel said, that's what we want in Daniel chapter 1. Remember that? And by the way, he said, look, let's do a test of that. Let's test that for 10 days. New England Journal of Medicine says that's the oldest scientific study. Actually, you might be interested to know this, that the Bible is the foundation of science. Science is not the foundation of the Bible. In fact, science only developed in Judeo-Christian cultures. All the other circular polytheistic cultures, whenever they saw a new phenomena, would come up with a new god, and they didn't know what to do. So you have, you know, you have got millions of gods in some countries. Um, and so they just came up with this circular, capricious thing. They didn't know how to explain it. But the god of the Hebrews, the monotheistic god, was credited with entering history and having a plan to actually change things to get better. And can you see that the sanctuary is actually a linear progression from ill health getting to better and better health? How many of you can see that? So fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. And don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I was talking to Pastor Doug before I came out here, and he's got some great insights on the application of the sanctuary of the body that I'm sure he'll, sell, he'll, he'll share on that amazing uh, sanctuary uh, AFCO course. Whatever you eat then, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do all to the glory of God. Moving from glory to glory to glory. Amen. How many of you like to be behind curtain three? Amen. So there was this idea of moving from glory to glory to glory. And, and this whole idea of the first angel's message. Um, how many of you like the uh, amazing facts team to do a series on the three angel's messages? Maybe amazing messages or something. So that first angel's message, fear God and give him glory. And how do you give him glory? Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So back to the almonds just for a minute. Almonds contain um, B vitamin folate and amino acid tyrosine, a precursor to dopamine, and they lower bad cholesterol, they raise good cholesterol. And so almonds <laughs> and nuts in the sanctuary, we have a vast depletion of omega-3s and different things. And uh, I have another talk I could give some other time, but how... This is all related to mental health as well, brain health. So the Adventists' key doctrine that's different than other churches is the sanctuary doctrine. Um, this is kind of the defining doctrinal difference. And naturally, because they looked at the health in the sanctuary, they really focus in on health, and they have quite a number of studies they've done way back in the 50s, the Adventist mortality study, then... You know, you have the Adventist Health Study 1, the Smog Study, Adventist Health Study 2, which is ongoing, and the Adventist Religion and Health Study. We cover all those in great detail in, in our class, uh, Religion and Health. But just a couple little slides that maybe are too bright. Uh, I didn't have someone put new backgrounds here. But I want to show you that it actually does make a difference. God loves you no matter what you eat or drink. He loves you if you, whatever. But he wants to love you longer. And how many of you want to stay around longer to torment your kids? Frankly, you know, you, you want to be there and say, you know, I remember that, because so, they're going to act like, you know. Um, but weight differences between vegetarians and non-vegetarians, vegans, they don't weigh as much. Lacto-ovo, they weigh a little more. Pesco, that's, that's fish, semi-vegetarians, and then eating everything. So if you actually follow that sanctuary plan, you're moving towards fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables, and you'll have less weight. Uh, have people done well in fighting off COVID-19 and other viruses that are obese? No, that's not, that's not been good. Um, my mother, who died from COVID-19, um, 
was a, a bit overweight. That didn't help her. Um, and so this sanctuary plan is going to help you um, increase your immunity because when you're overweight, you actually are um, more susceptible to infections and different things like that and many other problems, hypertension, all kinds of things. So I'm going to think that the sanctuary health plan is something to look into. Secondly, high blood pressure and diet. You can see the same thing, like I already mentioned. If you're overweight or different things, vegans have less all the way up to those that are eating whatever they want. If they eat everything, even the unclean meats especially, is going to hurt them. Cholesterol and diet. Cholesterol is associated to heart disease and all kinds of things. You'll notice, again, the same picture. And then diabetes and diet. You can see the same thing. Again, the sanctuary health program reversed the diseases that the people had in Egypt, and it still reverses them today because most people in America live like they're Egyptians. <laughs> Nothing against Egyptians, by the way. Right? Does God love Egyptians? Yeah. Does he love any background, of course. Now let's look for a minute at the sanctuary and mental health. The sanctuary, again, you entered into the gates. You go to the altar of sacrifice. You go to the laver. You go to the table of showbread. You have the altar of incense. And you have the Ark of the Covenant. This is an optimal plan for mental health as well. Enter into his gates with praise and thanksgiving and gratitude. There are studies that show that drastically increases mental health. Just keeping a gratitude journal weekly but daily is even better. And I just read research that actually hourly is even better. And so as you're praising God, as you're, as, and by there's the science studies that show that if you praise God or if you're praising or, or you're expressing gratitude, you have um, willpower. And your willpower is actually refueled by praise. It goes up and down based on you, how you praise. Well, someone told me, uh, you know, Daniel, our last speaker, is always so positive. Try and hang around a guy like that. Just, you know, he's just like, he's jumping around. You just, you got to be happy. You know, you're just like, wow, he's, uh, this, this is great. Um, confession of sin. If we confess our sins out here. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just knowing that can happen is a huge thing because people struggle with burdens they need to get rid of. And I always am talking to my depressed and anxious patients that I work with with Dr. Nedley about how the sanctuary is a place to lay your burdens down. Someone said their favorite text on the panel discussion we had was casting all your cares upon him. And that's what the sanctuary was for. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'll take care of it. I got a bunch of fire. I'll burn it up. <laughs> I'll eventually get rid of it. Just leave it to me. What labor, the washing of the water of the word. The word actually washes you. The more I study the Bible, it's a mental health guide. I was just studying Galatians 5 the other day. It talks about how people fell, how they need to stand, how they need to walk, how they need to run, how Galatians 6, they carry someone else. I go, what a mental health guide that is. I could go through chapters, and I usually assign chapters of the Bible to people when they come with mental health problems. I say, just read this chapter. I don't even say anything. I know that it's going to cleanse their mind. And the next time we get back to you, they go, man, that was awesome. Well, what happened? Well, this is what happened. So that's the water of the washing of the Word. Baptism, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what. Baptism of the Holy Spirit um, with the lampstand, um, where he'll send his Holy Spirit in and then through you, and you'll have the fruits of the Spirit. He loves to give this gift of the Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all these different things. How many think that's a mental health program? And the Holy Spirit does. How many of you have ever had the Holy Spirit that do that in your life? This is part of the sanctuary health plan. The table of showbread. This is the bread of life. And sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. We just had that special number. It's my grandfather's favorite song and he would sing it as he was taking care of my grandmother after she'd had six strokes and he would take care of her but what really fueled him was the word of god masticating ruminating cogitating on the word of god the altar of incense prayer and intercession some people actually use the sanctuary as a way of praying i'm going to confess my sins i'm going to go through each piece of the sanctuary as a way of prayer and this prayer is so essential with mental health, and ultimately, in your presence is fullness of joy, the Ten Commandments, the Ark, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Perhaps one of my largest discoveries over the last 18 months was actually using the Ten Commandments for mental health. These Ten Commandments are the key to mental health. Let me explain why. 
When I talk to people, I say, are you dissatisfied? What's the scale of one to 10? They might tell me. Well, have you ever told lies to yourself or had lies told about you? Is, is that what's dissatisfying you? Sometimes people just, they tell themselves terrible stuff about themselves. I'm worthless, I'm no good, or they might hear somebody else tell you that lie to them. <laughs> uh, I remember when I was a kid, my dad said, you know what, you act like you have a demon. You know, I think he was probably right. Uh, you know, I think he was 100% right, but I kind of held on to that. And, I, and for a time, I started to act like I was a demon. I said, so I'm a demon, I'm going to act like a demon. Uh, how many just pray for my dad right now? I mean, he's, still, he's had, had a hard life with me. But lies. How many of you ever felt like you've been stolen from? Or how many of you steal other people, be, steal things because you're dissatisfied? You don't have enough money for your drugs, so you steal. What about intimacy? How close do you feel physically, emotionally, mentally to someone else? Who's your closest friend? You see, if you're dissatisfied, you, you keep telling yourself lies, you feel cheated, you don't feel like you have an intimate relationship, and ultimately, you feel like getting angry, maybe killing somebody. Did you realize these are the last five commandments? And as you talk to people about them and as you go through them, God wants you to be satisfied. He wants you to have truth in the inward parts. He wants you to not be stealing from or stolen from. He wants you to have ultimate prophetic intimacy, and he wants you to be filled with joy, not anger. But a lot of people are ready to kill themselves. Can you see why they need the Ten Commandments? So they self-meditate by momentary highs, drugs, sex, alcohol, overindulgence, excess of even good things, which leads to ill health physically and also emotionally and mentally. Many times the problem is that they have a problem with their parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. They don't like their father and mother. Or they don't like a parental figure. They don't like law enforcement. They don't like teachers. They don't like educators. And when you ask them, why is it that you feel like killing somebody? Why is it that you're having these problems? Many times it will be traced back to this. So what they need is rest and rejuvenation. They need a time of intimacy each week with someone who loves and cares for them. What they need is authenticity. In vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Vanity comes from listening to false doctrines. And what you need is truth in the inward parts, not lies. You need authenticity. Yes? Ultimately, you need pure love, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You see, they were coming out of Egypt. Remember, they were coming out of Egypt when they got these. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the house of... So I try and say, hey, do you, did anyone ever help you escape anything? That's the Exodus experience, isn't it? And when you leave, you know how many gods they had in Egypt? They had like 100 gods. They had like 2,000 commandments they had to keep. And he goes, no, just keep my commandments. There's only 10 of them. Enter into a relationship with me that's authentic. Don't go back to keeping these false things again. Have a day of rest with me. This is all sanctuary stuff. Be rejuvenated. And, and then become a spiritual parent. <laughs> I tell my marriage and family class that I teach, you need to have kids before you have kids, and you need to get married before you're married. They're going, what are you talking about? Marry Jesus and have all kinds of kids before you have kids. Because if you don't get married and have kids before you get married and have kids, you're not fit to get married and have kids. And they just look at me and they just go, what are you talking about? But how many of you know what I'm talking about? Because what we need is more spiritual parents out there. How many say amen to that? Amen. So when you have this, by the way, each one of these commandments, it says, I am the Lord thy God, Yahweh Elohim. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. It, it associates with every one of the first five commandments. It's not associated. He doesn't put his name next to these. He doesn't say, I am the Lord thy God, so don't kill. He doesn't say that. The name of God is right here. If you keep the first five, you'll never experience the last five. It, this is powerful, really, because God doesn't want you to get high. He wants you to get most high. Can you say amen? <laughs> Problem is we don't get high enough. And he wants depression to be recovered from. And the key to depression recovery is the Ten Commandments found in sanctuary health. All right. By the way, that has been the most precious insight I think God has ever given me. I really do. Now, I want to end up in my final remaining moments with this presentation, hopefully not my final remaining moments. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about health, you know. The guy dies during his health lecture. Um, <laughs> okay, sanctuary and prophetic health. Pro, before finally to speak, prophetic health. I want to give you now a paradigm as you leave, because it's, it's not, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can study deeply on this thing, like I said. I, I could study for years with you on it, but I want to give you this idea. And it's coming because I believe the Adventist church has been raised up to preach the amazing sanctuary message, including amazing physical health, amazing emotional health, amazing mental health. And that is based on this text, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Adventists are the longest living people on the planet 
now, and uh, there's books written about it. But I want to look at now this, this prophecy, and I want to show you how it's all related to health. Unto 2,300 years until the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, that means the sanctuary had to be rebuilt in Daniel's day. 457 B.C., no, therefore, understand that going forth from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Remember that? So they had to reestablish the sanctuary, and we've already seen that the sanctuary was a place that was going to be put in their midst, and if they followed everything I said concerning health, they would have none of the diseases of the Egyptians. Can you see that? Hallelujah. He was reversing that, and so he came up with a place of healing. This church is a place of healing. Amazing Facts is a place of healing. Every Seventh-day Adventist church is a place of healing. But wherever you are, you should create a sanctuary space. Even when I'm on a plane, I'm sitting next to someone. I've got, I, I need to create a sanctuary space. So I read, I, I try and figure out what the health problem is they have. Pretty, sometimes it's very obvious. You know, if they, if they smell like smoke, I don't assume it's the plane. It's probably them. So I pull out my laptop. I pull up a stop smoking seminar, and then I just kind of slightly turn it towards them. <laughs> As I review those slides, and I, go st I, I start going, mm, wow, mm, mm, uh, mm, mm. And pretty soon, we're talking about it. Create a sanctuary space. Secondly, God entered in 483 years later to that sanctuary space, but look for a minute as to where Paul, the New Testament, got that idea of whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because Leviticus is the center of the Pentateuch, the first five books, and the center of the center is chapter 16. But notice what builds up to 16. Leviticus 10, clean drink. Leviticus 11, clean meat. Le Leviticus 12, cleanliness after giving birth. Leviticus 13, clean skin. 14, clean up leprous zones. 15, clean up bodily discharges, and then 16, the ultimate day of cleansing, the day of atonement where the glory of God was revealed, and then that chiastic center also says don't eat blood. Have sexual and morality laws and have social laws so you can love with a clean heart, lest the land vomit out the unclean, and have clean church leadership, and have a clean family unit and leadership. Can you see that this chiastic or kind of sandwich with the best thing in the middle is moving right to, to the Day of Atonement? And this is why Paul could say, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the what? Glory of God. So why don't we preach about that more? Well, I do. <laughs> you preach about it too. Everybody knows pretty much by looking at you what your health message is. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, now, 483 years later, after the temple was rebuilt, this place of healing, Messiah enters the temple, right? And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news, recovery of sight, healing of the blind, of the oppressed, and all those different things. And he's anointed at the time of his baptism. But how do you know? That he has the Holy Spirit, he says. He was anointed with power, with the Holy Spirit. And how do you know? Because he went about doing good, Acts 10, 38, and healing all manner of sickness and disease. The reason they knew he had the Holy Spirit was because everybody started getting better around Jesus for three and a half years. Can you say hallelujah? Sanctuary health, he was the temple, entering the temple, and he was doing something that they never, they weren't doing because they lost their right arm. And so the right arm comes and reveals itself through his ministry. He healed the sick. He touched the untouchables. People would go through the roof to see him, and finally he raised the dead, and they said, that's it, we're killing him. So don't think universal health plans will really work. <laughs> Some people are happy you're sick. That's how they drive their Mercedes. You see the people, they're usually the professionals, they're driving these nice cars. And they're taking care of you. Nothing against them. If I preached this message, you know, in one of our health centers, I'd probably get kicked out, but I'm here. So, <laughs> on so large a scale did he conduct his work of healing and teaching 
that there was no building in Palestine large enough to receive the multitudes that came to him. Now, you guys had a lot of people here on Sabbath. I heard it was packed, but that's actually abysmal compared to Jesus. Uh, if Jesus came to this place, uh, you would have no room. And the reason that happened was because of his practical gospel health ministry. How many think that we need to be more like Jesus? Now, in the middle of the week, he's cut off, but not for himself, for you and me. The head comes. And in describing Jesus on the cross, there's a passage that's quoted numerous times in the New Testament. It's Isaiah 53. He was a man who was acquainted with griefs and sorrows. What are those? What are those? It's on the screen. <laughs> Emotions. So he came not to heal us just physically, but also emotionally. Can you say hallelujah? He didn't back away from mental health, spiritual healing as well. He identified with sin, shame, and guilt. He was alone. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. He was abused. He was physically violated. He was shamed and humiliated. He was verbally and mentally abused by authority figures, again, as we mentioned in that Ten Commandments. And he was abused by Satan himself. And he was tempted to self-medicate. He was tempted to get angry. He was tempted to lie, to come down from the cross, to do all those things. He was, a, he was tempted, but he never gave in. Can you say hallelujah? And so he is the secret to overcoming addiction. I was asking why. Why have you forsaken me, God? How many can see how the cross is the center for mental health and emotional healing? In all their afflictions, he was afflicted, Isaiah 63, 9. And he sent his word. Jesus was also called the word. And healed them. So if you ever feel that no one understands, just look to Jesus. Maybe take your story and put it next to his story and see how he identifies with your story and find healing emotionally at the cross. <clears throat> Are you beginning to get excited about sanctuary health? Yes. Prophetic sanctuary health. So every aspect, every touch point of this 2300 day prophecy has this health element. Create a sanctuary space, enter it to do physical acts of healing, enter it to do emotional acts of healing. But finally, it gets very exciting. Jesus dies. He's the head. He's cut off in the middle of the week. So how does this message go on? Well, we're told in Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we neglect so great a salvation which was first spoken us by the Lord, but then confirmed by his disciples? Confirmed. So they confirmed the covenant. They followed Jesus' example. They had emotional and mental health cleansing in Acts chapter 1 among themselves. They had the preaching of, of um, the resurrection, which is an all. How many think the resurrection could probably much heal everything? Yeah. They're preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many think the resurrection doctrine is actually going to take care of all sickness and sin and disease? Are you guys awake? This is actually the morning many people are celebrating that. Huh? <laughs> Acts chapter 3, the healing of the man at the gate, beautiful. Acts chapter 4, talking about the healing of the man at the gate, beautiful again. Acts chapter 5, the healing of everybody at Solomon's porch. Acts chapter 6... Now kicks it up a notch because Stephen, he starts preaching. And what does he say? We cannot neglect the Hellenists and just serve the Hebrews. In other words, there's not going to be a bypassing of the Samaritans or the Hellenists because Samaritan lives matter and Hellenist lives matter, not just Hebrews lives matter. And Jesus had taught that already in his ministry and the stories of the Good Samaritan, right? And they had to get over that. It has to be a message for every kindred, tribe, tongue, and people, or it's not authentic. The sanctuary message is for everybody. And they'd kick everybody out, find reasons they couldn't come to the sanctuary. And here they are, and they're feeding everybody. 
They're out in the community, and they're doing social healing. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. And guess what happened? It was so electrifying that actually ministers of other denominations begin to pull up their RVs and listen in, or pull, uh, tune in their TVs and listen in. And it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, a great number of the priests believed. Think about that for a minute. The leadership in terms of the Knesset and in terms of the different people, they didn't believe, and they had this covenant lawsuit against them in Acts chapter 6, 7, uh, 6 and 7. It's, it's, it's told all about how they rejected. But the, a great number of the priests believed. Don't say the Jews rejected Jesus. The Jews accepted Jesus. You can make a case that the Jews accepted Jesus, can't you? In fact, they're the first ones that did, so don't be anti-Semitic. And the social acts of healing, they could not believe it. You're reaching out to the Hellenists? <laughs> they said, we've got to kill this guy. This guy. He's attacking our sanctuary doctrine, which had been corrupted. How many of you are following me? I don't hear anybody. They're all like kind of, I need to go out and start doing CPR, doing my, uh, doing my <laughs> boom, help. <laughs> All right. Now, when I got this idea recently up where I work, we decided, what if we just did that? What if we went out and wore shirts and said, do you need help? And we started to go out in the community and start help people. We didn't go out and say, do you want to study Bible? I'm, I'm, I'm good with that too, but some people are not ready for that. Do you need help? Everybody seems to need help. I remember the first house we went to, the very first house we went to, I said, God, this doesn't work. I'm doomed. I'm going to lose my job. I can still work at Burger King, but I go on. So I go to the first house. We clean this house up. We got someone with a Ph.D. and an M.D. and me and our students. That we didn't tell them what we had. We weren't re wearing M.D., Ph.D., you know, but we were just out there, and we were just serving. We were there five hours. We cleaned up their house. It was an extreme makeover inside the house. By the end of it, they were crying. They said, Why are you, uh, who, what do you do? And I saw this guy, he's got a Ph.D. in this, and he teaches neuroscience at the school over there. This guy's a medical doctor. He has his day off. He goes, what? You could be making a lot of money. That's what the guy said. <laughs> what do you do? I, uh, I, can't, I really can't put a finger on it. I do different. <laughs> so then the guy goes, you know what? Is there anybody over there that... Uh, could do a wedding ceremony, because my wife and I, you think this is my wife, but we've never been married. Could you marry someone over there, marry us? And all my students says, he can do it, he can do it. And he goes, oh, you must be a minister. <laughs> and I said, but I don't, I don't marry people that are not of the same faith. Oh, yeah, we, we're, we're of the same faith. What faith are you? We're of 3ABN faith. They'd been watching 3ABN. And then they said, by the way, could you baptize us? Can you say amen? amen? This is what happens when you get out into the community and do social healing. You know, the neighborhoods come alive in my neighborhood. I know everybody and even their dog. Because I've knocked on all their doors and I've helped them with practical things. And I think Jesus wants us to do that. And as we do that, then they op they're open to what? They're open to, it brings emotional healing. It may bring physical differences, and they want to go to your place of healing. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. So this is sanctuary prophetic hill. It was so impressive that they, they, they reached the entire world in one generation. Entire world. They confirmed the sanctuary message in one generation. Now, by the way, let's fast forward to right now. 1,810 years later, you have a church called the Remnant Church that's going to be preaching 
unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. By the way, the guy asked me, next house we go to uh, down the street, I'm taking care of this, we clean up this guy's yard, and he goes, explain to me why you're doing this. What's wrong with you? He's basically saying. Why do you do this? You clean this all. Why did you spend all your time cleaning up? I said, I'm asking myself the same question. I mean, <laughs> actually, your yard looks better than my yard at this point. <laughs> but he goes, why is it? Why is that? I said, well, let me, I'll just explain it to you very simply. At our institute, at our college, we are college, we like to clean stuff up. <laughs> And the reason we do is because God is cleaning stuff up, we believe, in heaven. He's cleaning stuff in, in heaven, so we clean stuff up too. We have a program called the New Star Program that cleans out your coronary arteries. We have a program called Depression Recovery that cleans out bad thoughts. And we have a program called Total Community Involvement that cleans up your yard. <laughs> and that's why we're cleaning your yard up. He goes, wow. That's cool. How many of you want to be known as not only sanctuary health people, but prophetic sanctuary health people? Because we're called to last day healing. We're called to share the healing that we find in Daniel 9 in Jesus. We're called to share the healing that we find with the seven Sabbath miracles that I didn't have chance to cover. But come up sometime to Weimar, we just put in a Sabbath trail you can walk the Sabbath trail and learn about it all on the rocks, 36 rocks. We're called to Day of Atonement healing that I also briefly covered today. We're called to be end time Christians who restore people to health, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, sanctuary health. And then Jesus can come again. And we're not, we're not people that point to this because we're pointing to ourselves because Jesus is the door. Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus is the laver. Jesus is the lampstand. Jesus is the table of showbread. Jesus is the altar of incense. Jesus is the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus is the healer. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us for the act of healing. And without his power, Without his vitalizing power, we could never be healthy. We could never do anything. And everything we have and everything we share only is because of Jesus. And Adventists need this message as much as anybody else. When they started, they were dying at age 30 and 40. But now they have the longest life expectancy. And it's all because of Jesus. And it's all because of the sanctuary. And it's all because of sanctuary health. And so we're actually supposed to share it with you because the Bible says, the spirit of the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him as a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So this is a message that you need to look deeper into, but also share with others. Because that's what Jesus did. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you became flesh and dwelt among us. May we create sanctuary spaces through your power. May we enter them with physical acts of healing. May we be used to bring emotional and mental and spiritual healing. May we be used to bring healing in our homes, in our communities, and in this world. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. May we be your right hand today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was just a wonderful pause to look at the sanctuary and our health. And we as Adventists, that sanctuary message is what is 
a, a distinguishable factor of our faith and being able to share that with others and create a sanctuary space right where we are. Um, he did a closing prayer, <laughs> but are there any questions? No? Um, well, let's close out with a word of prayer. And uh, as I said, this was an introduction. So we'll be going into more depth um, with the sanctuary message. Sister Rita, I'm sorry, I couldn't um, see your text when uh, I was sharing screen. So I hope you were able to hear, but if not, um, this will be posted to you too. But I saw you came in and out a few times. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with each of us here as we apply the sanctuary health message in our lives so that we can, so others can see you and you will be glorified in our life. This is our prayer. In your name we pray, thy will be done. Amen.